welcome to Watchtower History. The Modern View from St. Louis, Missouri, July 6, 1939. It says, Labor Speaks on Father Coughlinism. This is interesting because it gives examples of Rutherford's rhetoric and how the public perceived it. And they saw it similar to Coughlin's idea. The Advocate states, I'm told thousands of St. Louis people who formerly admired Father Charles Coughlin now criticize him, saddened by the fact that the once famous radio priest seems to have completely collapsed as a liberal. His June 4th broadcast was a shock. Attempting to deny that he's either anti-Jew or pro-Nazi, Coughlin said, It is true, however, that I regarded it Nazism and still regard it as a defense mechanism against communism. <laughs> Naturally, Father Coughlin, like many others of us, opposed communism because of his atheistic, godless, anti-religious philosophy. But the same indictment applies with equal force to Hitlerism. In his book, Mein Kampf, Hitler had this to say on the subject of church and Christianity. The primacy of the state over the church must be recognized. And the question of the divinity of Christ is ridiculous and unessential. All right. And so now, in the same article, it says, anti-Semitism on your doorstep. So if any of us are inclined to regard the Jews in New York as being over-militant in their fight on anti-Semitism, let them consider that on almost every important street corner in New York, Father Coughlin's social justice is sold by hawkers who are, to say the least, careless in their statements about Jews. Read the truth about Jews, we heard one cry. Read social justice, intelligent reading for intelligent people, shouted another. Many of these papers are folded at some particular vicious passage concerning the Jew and waved in the face of the passerby. Now, now again, <laughs> a reminder. Didn't Coughlin quote Rutherford's work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and what are these people saying about Coughlin? <laughs> I mean, it, it's just... And, and where's Coughlin getting his ideas? He's getting them from Ford and from the same source that Ford got them. According to the New York Herald Tribune, the disturbance, and they're again talking about that disturbance, was created by Coughlin supporters who were not in agreement with the views of Judge Rutherford, who was to be the chief speaker. Neither are we in sympathy with Judge Rutherford's rancid views on religion, but we call attention to this extremely undemocratic procedure on the part of the alleged Coughlinites in making their disagreement manifest. This is America, and we still have a Bill of Rights. Their, their method is sheer fascism and reeks with danger. I, I just... And again, the, the Jehovah's Witnesses current do not understand the origin of their religion. The, the, look what they're even the the, the so-called, I'll say it, worldly <laughs> media and press newspapers, they're comparing Rutherford with Coughlin and they're condemning Coughlin for anti-Semitic hate and, and all that. He's right up in there with them. Yeah. They're putting him in the same category. And he built, again, that's the religion. He built, a re his ideas came out of the hate that he had for for everyone, Catholic and Jew. And he, and he twisted, he turned the scriptures in the Bible to get rid of the Jews. And in the process, he had to get rid of Jesus, had to get rid of everybody else to uh, send you directly to him for salvation so that you can follow him. It, it's that's your religion, whether you like it or not. And, and as you said, this is what they were saying about him. So what were the newspapers saying about Rutherford and his and his lectures? Right. So here's a newspaper advertisement about Rutherford and giving a lecture on world control. Judge Rutherford is well known throughout the earth by his famous weekly broadcasts. Uh, he's the one man who has challenged the combined clergy of the world to public debate that the peoples may hear the truths which vitally concern them. And so what did the newspapers get out of his lectures? Here's a title. Another nomination for dictatorship is made. <laughs> <laughs> Difference of opinion on Judge Rutherford. Judge Rutherford is said to be misunderstood. Consolation Magazine, September 4th, 1940. So the name of the golden age had changed now to Consolation, and then later it changes to Awake. And there's an article in here, Religious Governments versus the Theocracy. 
and they mention Father Coughlin. It says, Charles Coughlin, America's radio demagogue, thinks Hitler the only real Christian leader. He has a strange idea of what, of what constitutes a Christian. Perhaps he's unduly impressed with the fact that Hitler is often in attendance at St. Hedwig's Cathedral in Berlin. But attending a church does not make a man a Christian. The most interesting circumstance is some who broke away from the witnesses when they saw the troubles coming are now knee-deep in demonism. Their meanings developed into trances. They bestowed the titles of kings and some of their members. They lost the protection of Jehovah God in her book for destruction. It's very, very interesting how he's how they're talking about Coughlin, how they're talking about those who had been witnesses who broke away and they're all in demonism. It's all just, they're demonizing their enemies constantly instead of just stating the facts or just leaving it alone. If you're always demonizing your enemy, how can everyone literally be against you? All you're showing to others then is that you're paranoid. We show a lot of stuff once in a while. We got to get back to paranoid to remind what, and it, it's a religion based out of fear, based out of paranoia, based out of that. And that's always based, running in the background. Yeah. Based and, out of paranoia, based on conspiracy, based on these anti-Semitic ideas, Ford, Coughlin, and others were promoting at the time. In every even current article, same. it, it is the same thing. It's in the background. There's a paranoia running. A fear mongering, a destruction, something going on. So nothing's changed. All right. So the Jehovah's Witness Bulletin for December 1st, 1933 mentions this as well. But like everything, Rutherford uses whatever story he can to advertise, advertise, advertise. The Golden Age of January 31st, 1934 also mentions it. Again, CR. Intolerance discussion. The Watchtower of April 1st, 1939 mentions this story and then makes a prophetic application about it. There's more to the story here than it appears. And so remember, this is about uh, the, the intolerance booklet. Why religious intolerance in America? And throughout that speech, the speaker was surrounded by armed policemen bearing revolvers and machine guns. So what they did is on September 1st to 29th, 1933, a special campaign by Jehovah's Witnesses was carried forward in which they distributed a large amount of literature exposing the scriptural denunciation of the religionists, the Roman Catholic hierarchy. Referring now to the drama, Joshua begins to carry out the instructions. And it came to pass when Joshua had spoken unto the people that the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns passed on before the Lord and blew with the trumpets and the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord followed them. In the fulfillment of that part of the picture, action began in the spring of 1933 when the sound equipment began to do its part in the siege of Christendom and to typical Jericho. Now, I could see the connection he's trying to make sound equipment and the trumpets blowing. He's trying to, combined them and say, hey, that was a picture of what we're doing. He continues. And that year, several hundred thousand sound machines went into action. And from then to this day, they have increased in number and in activity. During the same year, there was a considerable radio casting of the kingdom message in various lands. And it was in June of that year that the Pope issued an order to the Catholic population that they were not to listen to that man, Rutherford who did the broadcasting in October that year, the book preparation was issued in which was contained much information by the Lord for the encouragement of his people. Joshua's orders were carried out exactly as given. And the scripture in Joshua six, nine says, and the armed men went before the priests that blew with the trumpets and the reward came after the ark and the priests going on and blowing with the trumpets. Visualize that procession. Armed men in the front, armed men in the rear, priests in the center, bearing the ark and blowing their trumpets. Penton, in his book, Jehovah's Witnesses in Canada, also mentions it. Penton mentions it as Catholic intimidation. Remember, Penton was a Jehovah's Witness when he wrote that book. 
Check out his Apocalypse Delayed for more. So in the 1930s, as Rutherford's pushing these conspiratorial ideas, this paranoia that he's using these as the foundation for his theology, for his doctrine, he's pushing these ideas of fear about Armageddon. Remember, Russell's earlier thought about Armageddon was, well, if you're not part of us and you don't survive Armageddon, you'll still be in that future paradise on earth where everything is lovely and beautiful. Rutherford changed that. Rutherford was bringing this judgmental message. And in bringing this judgmental message, it brought persecution on them and it increased the paranoia. And so Rutherford has to actually make a statement here. Don't concern yourself about who will or will not die at Armageddon, but concern yourself about your own duty to deliver the message as God commands. It's not who will survive Armageddon, but who will die at Armageddon. And so don't his, worry about it. Just just sell my books and give me the money. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Ultimately, advertise, advertise, advertise. Yeah, ultimately, he he created quite a lifestyle for himself. A big mansion and very nice, expensive Cadillacs. So you could see during this time period, you know, these lectures Rutherford is giving is kind of hinting towards these conspiratorial ideas as well. And as we've seen, as we've discussed, there were those who are questioning Rutherford's new paranoid interpretation of Armageddon that he was introducing into Watchtower with these conspiracy theories, making them the foundation for his new Watchtower doctrine. World control, yes. Who will rule and control the world in the future? What hope is there for better conditions? These affect your welfare. Jehovah answers them. So remember, during the 1920s, there is these ideas Ford was pushing about the Jews trying to control the world. And so Rutherford's asking the question, who's going to control the world? It has a double entente here. There's a double meaning to what he's pushing. Rutherford was so familiar with these ideas to the point he was putting it right into his advertising. And this shows what we've been saying for the last several episodes of our Roadmap series. And so if you read some of the letters about this lecture that Rutherford gave, there's a Leroy Swingle, and he's trying to defend Rutherford. He's a Watchtower follower. And he's trying to defend Rutherford on this particular lecture. Swingle says, Those listeners to his lecture on world control who know what our Lord said on several occasions, what the apostles Peter, James, and Paul wrote concerning Jesus Christ and the world at his second coming, will agree that Rutherford was a true and faithful witness of God in Christ. As a man, Rutherford desires no defense, and as one of Jehovah's Witnesses, he needs none. There's a response in the newspaper following the lecture. And as C.S. Wilkinson writes in, stating, I have just listened to Judge Rutherford's nationwide broadcast on world control. And the fact that he claims a sale of a million and a half copies of his books indicates that Barnum is still writing his estimate of the public. But after painting a fairly accurate word picture of present world conditions and quoting scripture to prove that its destruction is at hand, he proceeds to instruct the people how to avert the dire results of this catastrophe. First, they are to obtain a copy of his book. <laughs> so, they got it. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> they got it. <laughs> and I like how we put in there, the uh, Jesus Christ, the executive and executioner of Jehovah God, slaughters <laughs> all the wicked. <laughs> you know. It, it, and only the witnesses survive, yeah. And he is, Rutherford, he is self-appointed witness of God, sent to warn them. They, they nailed him. Mark on the forehead. <laughs> if you don't buy, read his book. I mean, they, they really put in perspective what, what everybody sees, but they don't. The letter continues. And I like that. He says, levity aside, it must be concluded that Rutherford is a dynamic bookseller. Or is there something more subtle and sinister in this gesture? 
the fact that the international bankers are specifically mentioned in the broadcast and that the people are warned against joining any movement or taking any action in their own behalf savors of Hebrew philosophy and sanctity. They are to remain passive and inactive until Jehovah and Christ Jesus start the fireworks and destroy the adversary. And so here is somebody who heard Rutherford's lecture on the radio and bringing in this idea about the international bankers, again, thinking back to Ford's conspiratorial ideas, these ideas that Rutherford's bringing into Watchtower and building the religion out of. And specifically, international Jewish bankers, just like Ford, Coughlin, the Nazis, and others were promoting at exactly the same time. This is what Rutherford is using for the foundation of his theology. And I like how the end, the international bankers who Rutherford pretends to assail. It is a clever coup, and a lot of people will fall for it. <laughs> 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 and they did un unfortunately they did. Yeah. and these are from uh norfolk daily news uh may 12 1934 the block plan from brooklyn citizen january 15th 1934 salt lake telegram may 16th 1934 and defends rutherford salt lake telegram may 21st 1934 if you want to look these up yourself in the mid-1920s, you can start seeing this replacement theology in Watchtower already. Remember that Rutherford had written his book, Comfort for the Jews, and he and Macmillan had gone to Israel. And Macmillan was touring the United States giving lectures about the return of the Jews to Palestine. But at the same time that Macmillan is doing this, he has a statement that sounds very much like where Watchtower was going to go. Macmillan says, The restoration of Israel does not mean that commercialism, remember Rutherford's statements about the commercial Jew, is to be enthroned, nor that higher criticism is to be a dominant factor in the new government to be established in Palestine. Not everyone who claims to be a Jew is a Jew. A Jew from Jehovah's standpoint is one who is the offspring of Abraham and has the faith of Abraham. The restoration of the Jews at this time is by divine favor and nothing can stop it. And then it was just a couple of months later when the Birth of the Nation article came out and that's where the, quote, spiritual Israel, unquote, that Rutherford was creating was really coming from. And that's what I was going to add. It almost seems like this is the groundwork, getting the people ready for what's coming. They can't spring it all at once because people will. But if you if you chop it up, the meat and the meat, the spiritual food that they're giving them in tiny little bites and let them. Now it's not a shock because now they could build upon that. And what are they building upon? They're building upon not everyone who claims to be a Jew is a Jew. You, you just you just got that idea in their head that later if someone says we're spiritual Israel, that they can't be. We're something else. And then they explain it. They explain it. A Jew from Jehovah's viewpoint is one who is the offspring of Abraham and has the faith of Abraham. Who meets that category? Who meets that criteria? And remember, here's a statement where Macmillan is warning about commercial Jews towards international Jew. Knowing what we know now about how Watchtower used this phrase, they're already bringing in some of these conspiratorial ideas into the Watchtower lectures in the early and mid-1920s. Here, Macmillan's incorporating it into his lectures that are getting reported in the newspapers. And Watchtower is soon to go full head on steam into those Jewish anti-Semitic conspiracy theories right after that. Now, I'd like to comment on the last sentence here, because that, that could go either way, the way, they, the way it was said. The restoration of the Jews at this time is by divine favor, and nothing can stop it. 
Okay. The divine favor fell upon them, according to them. So now the people think, okay, the restoration, yes, the, the, the new spiritual Israel, which now there's two spiritual Israels if we discussed in the past. So now the second spiritual Israel going on here has the divine favor. Nothing can stop it. Advertise, 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 move forward, like with the organization. That that's he he brought his politics and in, in his speaking into it. As we saw. Rutherford saved those anti-Semitic Rothschild conspiracy theories from the Populist Party for 30 years. And we can see from the January 10th, 1925 Ogden Standard Examiner that Macmillan is mentioning Henry Ford as well. This article states that the Bible tells more about the returning favor to the Jew than Henry Ford or the Dearborn Independent ever dreamed of. How did Henry Ford or the Dearborn Independent ever suggest that favor was returning to the Jews? Ford's paper was suggesting through the conspiracies that the Jews were taking it through coercion. And here's an example where Watchtower's even mentioning these conspiracies yet again. Even suggesting that there were Jews in Palestine that might try to take it that same exact way. Remember, Watchtower is doing what many Christians have done over the years. Watchtower was separating the good Jews from the bad Jews. In the early 1920s, Watchtower thought that the good Jews would be the ones that God was returning favor to in Palestine. And it was these bad Jews, these international banker Jews, that Watchtower and other Christians thought that they were conspiring to dominate the world. It was later on when Rutherford and Watchtower completely replaced the Jews with themselves and then said all Jews were bad. All Jews were part of that worldwide conspiracy. And that's what Rutherford was talking about when he talked about international Jews, commercial Jews, and Jews in general in relation to the conspiracies that he was pushing in the 1920s and especially during the 1930s. At the same time, Henry Ford was doing that. And at the same time, Father Coughlin was doing that. At the same time, the Nazis were doing that. Here's an example where Watchtower is mentioning these conspiracies yet again. Here, Watchtower was continuing down this conspiratorial path. Better yet, how did how did Macmillan know what Henry Ford and the Dearborn Independent were dreaming of? How did they know that? They were reading it. Which is why we see many mentions of Ford and quotations from the Dearborn Independent in various Watchtower publications during this time period. Not only was Rutherford and Van Amberg familiar with Ford's conspiracies, but Macmillan was as well. But we have some of the Bible students of the time period, such as this William A. Baker, who gives a lecture on, in Portland, Oregon, the Capital Journal from Salem, Oregon. The Jewish menace, is it fact or fiction? Has present world anti-Semitism Bible significance? Is Henry Ford a cause or effect? Baker was talking against these anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. Remember those charts that we showed from Penton's Apocalypse Delayed, where we see a large drop in Watchtower followers in this time period? From what we've shown, our suggestion is that those who opposed Rutherford's ideas, like Baker here, were disfellowshipped, or they just simply left because they knew these anti-Semitic conspiracies and Rutherford's replacement theology was just plain wrong. The Tampa Tribune from March 14th, 1921 has an interesting version of Rutherford's lecture, Millions Now Living Will Never Die. Remember, this is 1921, and Rutherford is already mentioning some of these anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, and it's under the heading, Zionists Working Systematically. Rutherford says, Zionism will not succeed if selfish, ambitious politicians dominate it. 
Here's those ideas again. And a little further down, it says, there is now a worldwide conspiracy against the Jew, which is being systematically prosecuted by cunning and false propaganda. Again, here's those ideas. Satan is the mastermind behind it for the reason that it is God's time to favor the Jew. And a little bit further down, he says, Mr. Henry Ford, here we go again, having obtained fame as a moneymaker and being ambitious for further notoriety, has lent his money to the publication of a number of scandalous articles against the Jews. He has been charged with being an ignoramus. He is certainly ignorant of the Bible, else he would not engage in this unkind and unjust assault upon the Jewish people. Remember, this is what Rutherford's saying in the early 1920s. But later, Rutherford himself is saying exactly the same things that Ford was saying. Rutherford his... Ford should read my books. <laughs> <laughs> he knows what Ford is saying because he and the other Watchtower followers were reading and quoting from Ford's paper. By the time the mid-1920s come around, Watchtower is already talking about the commercial Jews, the big business Jews that are conspiring to take over the world, the international Jew. Watchtower was separating the so-called big business greedy Jew with the religious Jew. That maybe favor would return to the religious Jew, but not the business Jew that they thought was conspiring to take over the world. Until Watchtower just replaced the Jew and said that we're the Jews and the Jews will never be in their homeland again. And probably what's even more important in this article is the first sentence. There is now a worldwide conspiracy against the Jew. How did he know there was a conspiracy against the Jew? Again, they're following Henry Ford. And we see multiple mentions of Ford and these ideas in Watchtower publications during this time period. Of course, in 1925, they thought favor was going to return to the Jew. And as we saw in our fourth trumpet blast discussion about Watchtower's message of hope, that was really a message of hate, that they realized that the Jews were not going to be in their homeland in 1925. So they thought maybe it would be a spiritual jubilee trumpet, a spiritual return, that Watchtower might be the spiritual Israel. And that since Rutherford was taking the lead of spiritual Israel, then he was the chosen one among the chosen ones. This is Rutherford's logic all the way through. And again, which it seems like I keep pointing it out, if there is spiritual Israel on earth, who's the spiritual Israel in heaven? You're back to two spiritual Israels. Does the Is there anywhere in the Bible where it says there's going to be two spiritual Israels? Very good point. Very good point. I've never read any such thing. Not only was Watchtower aware of these anti-Semitic conspiracies of Ford, but he was also aware of Ford's British ideas as well as being controlled by the international bankers. And you can see that here in this article. The article says, the British Empire is not only cognizant of this conspiracy, but acquiesces in it because it will ultimately furnish a pretext for her to attempt to take Palestine wholly for her own purposes. The conspiracy will increase in magnitude and will terminate in a concerted effort on the part of the conspirators to drive the Jews out of Palestine. This is clearly foretold by the prophet Ezekiel in the 38th chapter. All nations and peoples will combine against the Jew, will suffer greatly, as foretold by the prophet. And then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. In Zechariah 14, verses 1 to 3. Then the Jews will recognize fully that God is on their side, and the nations of the earth will likewise recognize that Jehovah's favor has returned to the Jews. No true Christian can engage in persecuting the Jew. It is contrary to the Spirit of Christ. Any Christian who understands the Bible will rejoice in seeing the Jew return to Palestine and build it up because it is God's time that this should be done and no class of men can successfully fight against Jehovah. Let the Jews take courage and the more they turn their minds to Jehovah, the more courage they will have. 
Palestine is destined to be the home for the Jew and ultimately the joy of the whole earth. It's so interesting here that they say that the Jews here that are regathered back to the land are there in unbelief and that they won't be converted to Christ until after Armageddon. And yet now, after Rutherford pushed his replacement theology, the idea then became that those were Jehovah's Witnesses. Yet if those are Jehovah's Witnesses and they're not converted until after Armageddon, then doesn't that mean that the Jehovah's Witnesses are in unbelief? Or that the Holy Spirit isn't poured out until after Armageddon? If that's Jehovah's Witnesses, then they don't have the Holy Spirit. And remember, Rutherford realized he had a problem with the Holy Spirit in some of those contexts, and he had to remove that. If you haven't seen our Will the Real Jehovah's Witnesses Please Stand Up discussion, where we talk about that replacement theology and how it doesn't work in the context, and our earlier episode of the Roadmap series, where we talk about why Rutherford had to lose the Holy Spirit, it's because of these things. They simply don't work in the context. And yet, a few years later, Rutherford and Nor and the Watchtower writers, even making abhorrent claims that what happened to the Jews in World War II and the Holocaust was their own fault, and making a false prophecy that they'll never be in their homeland. And when it happened, they had to go back and uh, revise the book and change that statement. And here in this version of the Millions Now Living Will Never Die lecture, you can see some of the early ideas and concepts of his conspiratorial ideas of his Anglo-American empires and the things that he's borrowing from Ford and later the ideas that Coughlin and the Nazis also promoted. The Covina Argus. Covina, California, March 30th, 1934. Ask the question, prophecy or propaganda? Judge Rutherford quoted at the top of this editorial column succeeded in arousing interest in his extensive broadcast last Sunday, which he titled World Control. Religious topics should be and generally are treated kindly by the press because newspapers are in the habit of leaning over backwards in attempts to give free dissemination when it originates from the pulpit of whatever doctrine. Judge Rutherford has a tremendous following as the head of the Bible Students Association because of his liberal use of the radio. But if we may be allowed to comment carefully, it did not seem to us that his address was fair to the ministers of all faiths. He was harsh and dogmatic in his denunciations of those ministers who lend their names and efforts to the bringing about of peace through the League of Nations. Some of us may agree that the League of Nations is dangerous at this time, and the entrance into it by the United States would involve us in the many undesirable intrigues constantly being fomented on the continent and in Asia. But the League of Nations is an idealism, and similar in its intent to that of the teachings of the Christian religion. And so it says a little bit further, Judge Rutherford, we believe, is assuming too strongly the role of a modern John the Baptist. His prophecy that a League of Nations will fail, that it's a creation of the devil, and the world must pass through another cataclysm of war, greater intensity than the world war before it can be cleansed, and made ready for the receiving of the Spirit, smacks too much of propaganda of this earth and not from above. <laughs> we would like it explained just how possible, how it's possible for Judge Rutherford and his association to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on one broadcast, as was the cause last Sunday. Every newspaper, even weeklies of the type of the Covina Argus, received paid advertising for the issue prior to the broadcast. And Big, that, you know, that's a good point here again uh, when we come across it in writing. A lot of it they were paying for mm -hmm. to, you know, volunteer labor selling, voluntarily selling books. They had a lot of money, which advertised <laughs> and got more money. Um, and once again, the common theme, they're not uh, condemning him for a righteous praise against uh, toward God's kingdom. They're. they're they're condemning him for his condemning everybody else. That's what they're really, really doing. It. And in his mind, though, the more they're doing that, the more they're attacking, the more it's persecution, the more it reinforces his idea 
that he is the chosen one meant to do this. Yeah, and I like that say they say basically in the last paragraph, could it be that the attack on the League of Nations was an attack that permeated his speech? That was the motivation behind his expensive broadcast. In other words, his conspiracies, his conspiratorial thinking, his paranoia, his attacks. Somehow they thought that people would be interested in that kind of a message. When you look at the papers, a lot of them just thought it was just rather odd. Mm -hmm. But he thought it was a message that everybody needed to hear. Yeah. And I think that's why when Noor became president after Rutherford's death, everything had to change. The public facing message got a lot kinder and gentler, but the internal message yeah. became harsher and stricter. In other words, they were trying to keep they were yeah. trying to keep the people that they had. In in other words, they wanted to look good on the outside, <laughs> so they attacked themselves from the inside. Whitewashed on the outside, but <laughs> an, another way on the inside. It, it's yeah, you, you nailed that with that. And Rutherford's booklet, The End of Nazism. He says, 1940 is here, and the abundance of evidence is to the effect that Catholic action is carrying out the threat of the priest O'Brien. Catholic fascist conspirators in Canada, you know, and they go on and on and on. But it says, Rutherford, as with everything, Rutherford's using these stories like this about the evidence of a Catholic conspiracy against him. He and Father Coughlin, again, were similar. They had similar ideas, yet they were on opposite sides. And remember Rutherford's term, the commercial Jew. Remember, Robel in the Wake article was trying to soft pedal this phrase and state, well, that's not a racist phrase. It's interesting when you look at the Capital Times from November 19th, 1923. It has an article where the Ku Klux Klan uses exactly that term, the commercial Jew. And so the commercial Jew for its international Jew, they were using these same conspiratorial ideas and Rutherford's bringing these ideas in basically using the same terminology as the Klan regarding the commercial Jew. And yet in the golden age, they refuse to really condemn or really criticize the Klan. And yet they're selling at the same time, selling radio time to the Klan in Canada. You can't make it up. Very, sometimes, very sometimes the truth is better than, <laughs> than the fiction. So when I started searching for this term commercial Jew in the books and the newspapers, I found it in multiple places. And, and one of those ways that these anti-Semitic conspiracy theories got to Williams, Jennings, Bryan, and the populist party was through a gentleman named Dan DeQuill. And Dan DeQuill was pushing these same ideas about the free silver trade. Remember, the Populist Party was trying to even out the playing field. Instead of, you know, the gold standard, they wanted a double standard, a silver and a gold standard, so that the silver miners and the farmers could be on the same economic playing field as the big business Rothschilds and the, and the gold uh, standard that they were railing against. And so they were trying to push this idea of the dual standard in the United States government. This They called it the bimetallism. But, you know, it didn't work out. And so somebody had to be blamed. And who did they blame? Well, like all throughout history, the Jews got blamed. And so this links the Populist Party, the Rothschild conspiracies, the anti-Semitic conspiracies, and Rutherford and Bryan who at this time period was pushing these ideas right at exactly the same time. And then we see Rutherford saving these populist conspiracies about the Rothschilds for 30 years and publishes them later, 30 years later in vindication. And then father Coughlin and the white supremacists pick it up from Rutherford and take it even further from there. <laughs> it is amazing that, Rutherford had such a good group of volunteers to deliver his message that it worked its way. And the dates show it, as we showed. It literally worked its way into the hands and idea. You know, even if it's something as simple as somebody reads it, tells their neighbor, 
tells their boss, <laughs> tells somebody mm -hmm. else. And all of a sudden somebody picks up on it and now they run with it. It's, it's easy to plant a seed and it, 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 the irony of, of Rutherford being in the middle of all the stuff we've been pointing out through our discussions uh, for quite some time now is just has me laughing inside. It really <laughs> does. Yeah. He campaigned for Brian. And Brian and the Populist Party were pushing these ideas, and those are the ideas Rutherford saved and built his religion out of later on. And so the American Jewish Archives for the spring-summer 1989 issue states that even as late as August 21st, 1892, DeQuill wrote an article in which he discussed speculations that Columbus might have been Jewish. But around June 1893, a dramatic change occurred in his columns, that was probably triggered by a sequence of related events. On June 26, as he had predicted, the British suspended the coinage of silver in India. And then a commercial panic resulted almost immediately in America and developed into the major depression of 1893 to 97. Silver mines were shut down, Comstock miners were laid off, and an exodus from the area accelerated. In August, President Cleveland convoked a special session of Congress to fight the panic by repealing the Sherman Silver Purchase Act. Remember, Sherman is part of the Rothschild conspiracy letters <laughs> that Rutherford, Rutherford published 30 years later, and which what, were forgeries. And what was Christopher's real name? Christopher Columberg? You know, oh. <laughs> you know to, <laughs> to come up with, with, with Christopher Columbus being Jewish, that, that, that one's quite a stretch. Well, Columbus might have been a Jew, or at least had some Jewish ancestry. And there's a current scholarship debate on that. In the years leading up to 1492, the Jews are being severely persecuted. And on November 23rd, 1492, the authorities were going to confiscate uh, all property that belonged to the Jews. And so they were warned in advance that this was going to happen, that the Jews planned a way to escape. And they were able to, some of them were able to uh, participate and help Christopher Columbus on his journey and discovery in the Americas. There's a current scholarship debate about whether or not Columbus was secretly a Jew. There's an opinion piece on CNN.com from a few years ago that has some interesting points. And, and you can find these same points in other scholarly literature. Columbus tithed one-tenth of his income to the poor and provided an anonymous dowry for poor girls. This is a part of Jewish customs. He also agreed to give money to a Jew who lived at the entrance of the Lisbon Jewish Quarter. On those documents, Columbus used a triangular signature of dots and letters that resembled inscriptions found on gravestones of Jewish cemeteries in Spain. He ordered his heirs to use the signature in perpetuity. According to British historian Cecil Roth's The History of the Moranos, the anagram was a cryptic substitute for the Kaddish, a prayer recited in the synagogue by mourners after the death of a close relative. Thus, Columbus' subterfuge allowed his sons to say Kadash for the crypto-Jewish father when he died. Finally, Columbus left money to support the crusade he hoped his successors would take up to liberate the Holy Land. Estelle, a linguistics professor at Georgetown University, has analyzed the language and syntax of hundreds of handwritten letters, diaries, and documents of Columbus and concluded that the explorer's primary written and spoken language was Castilian Spanish. She explained that the 15th century Castilian Spanish was the Yiddish of Spanish Jews, known as Ladino. At the top left-hand corner of all but one of 13 letters written by Columbus to his son Diego contained the handwritten Hebrew letters Bete, meaning Bezeri Tashim, with God's help. Observant Jews have for centuries customarily added this blessing to their letters. No letters to outsiders bear this mark. 
and the one letter to Diego in which this was omitted was one meant for King Ferdinand. In Simon Weisenthal's book, Sales of Hope, he argues that Columbus's voyage was motivated by a desire to find a safe haven for the Jews in light of their expulsion from Spain. Likewise, Carol Delaney, a cultural anthropologist at Stanford University, concludes that Columbus was a deeply religious man whose purpose was to sail to Asia to obtain gold in order to finance a crusade to take back Jerusalem and rebuild the Jews' holy temple. In Columbus's day, Jews widely believed that Jerusalem had to be liberated and the temple rebuilt for the Messiah to come. Scholars point to the date on which Columbus set sail as further evidence of his true motives. He was originally going to sail on August 2nd, 1492, a day that happened to coincide with the Jewish holiday of Tisha B'Arif, marking the destruction of the first and second holy temples of Jerusalem. Columbus postponed this original sail date by one day to avoid embarking on the holiday, which would have been considered by Jews to be an unlucky day to set sail. Coincidentally or significantly, the day he set forth was the very day that Jews were given the choice of converting, leaving Spain, or being killed. Columbus's voyage was not, as is commonly believed, funded by the deep pockets of Queen Isabella, but rather by two Jewish conversos and another prominent Jew, Luis de Santagil and Gabriel Sanchez, advanced an interest-free loan of 17,000 ducats from their own pockets to help pay for the voyage, as did Don Isaac Abranel, rabbi and Jewish statesman. Indeed, the first two letters Columbus sent back from his journey were not to Ferdinand and Isabella, but to Santa Gil and Sanchez, thanking them for their support and telling them what he had found. The evidence seems to bear out a far more complicated picture of the man for whom our nation now celebrates a national holiday and has named its capital. So uh, this article continues. In the place of his usual decursive and entertaining columns appeared one shrill diatribe after another and an extended series of demagoguery and abuse. For the first time, he became specific in blaming Jewish targets. His column in the Daily Tribune of June 4th criticized President Cleveland and his partner Levi. On July 2nd, he denounced the Shylock rule of the Rothschilds. On July 9th, he claimed that the prime movers and leaders in the war are the descendants of the money changers who were scourged out of the temple at Jerusalem by the Son of God. So again, the populist party picks up these ideas and Brian and Rutherford says him for 30 years and builds his religion out of these anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. Now in the Brownsville Herald, this is Brownsville, Texas, Thursday, May 23rd, 1940, Judge Rutherford not only repeats the accusation that the JWs were communist sympathizers, remember, this is what they're being accused of, but also that they were Nazi sympathizers. How could they be both? They were opposed to each other. In the newspaper stories from Del Rio, Texas, in Canon Book, Maine, it appeared that an effort was being made to label Jehovah's Witnesses as Nazi or communist sympathizers. All your publications, which I have read, emphatically show that you are opposed to all such dictatorships. Why do you think this attempt to distort your position is being made? So remember, the Nazis are making this accusation. And, of course, the reason why is because they were Zionists before Rutherford changed to a more anti-Semitic stance. And so four days after Hitler comes to power, he goes after the Jews and after the Bible students, he didn't make a distinction at the time between, between the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Bible students. So again, if you haven't seen our Stand Firm discussion, where we lay out a timeline of all the events of what was happening and some of the accusations that were made, be sure to check that out. And the actual article is here that the booklet Judge Rutherford uncovers a fifth column is referencing. Del Rio hits at pacifists, books burned are believed to be members of a group invited to leave San Benedito. 
there's a subheading in the article swastika mentioned and the accusation of course is made frequent use of the swastika in the literature was not only evidence of possible nazi connection the publisher said the man admitted he was receiving a monthly compensation of $13 as a war veteran mayor bradford said the man when asked if he would salute the american flag replied he saluted no flag and that it was nothing but a rag american legion commander r h word said they were just a religious outfit and of course there's a similar incident that occurred in the valley the last paragraph says that literature they were distributing was of a religious nature one pamphlet bore a drawing of three armored warriors with fascist communist and nazi insignia defiantly shooting arrows into the air the pamphlet characterized totalitarian regimes as defying god and so in the same article there's accusations that they're nazis and then evidence that they were not at the time rutherford was riling up the public and there's all sorts of accusations from all sorts of sides uh, accusations from the nazis accusations that they were nazis accusations from the communists accusations against the communists as we've been building out the evidence we're starting to see the hate speech that rutherford was spewing on the radio is what was causing a lot of the accusations that were being made against them. And speaking of Rutherford's hate speech on the radio, there was a congressional hearing, the 73rd Congress, that actually brought up Rutherford and Father Coughlin. 